Okay, well, hello everyone. I guess we'll get started here. So, welcome to the final webinar in a series of eight for the Forestry Adaptation Community of Practice. So, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Annette Morand, and I am the facilitator of the online adaptation communities of practice, and those are run by us here at OKR which is the Ontario Centre for Climate Impacts and Adaptation Resources, and we're located at Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario. So the way the webinar will run is as follows. So after this short introduction, we'll have the main presentation, which will go for about 30 to 35 minutes. And then at the end of the webinar, we'll have some time left over for any questions that you might have for the presenter. Um, so if you have any questions during the webinar, we just ask that you please hold them until the end. So before we get going, I just have a few housekeeping items to go over. So first, for those of you who dialed into the conference call line, uh, your lines have been automatically muted. And the reason for this is just to avoid any audio distractions, feedback, et cetera, during the webinar. Um, so to ask a question during the Q&A session, all you'll have to do is dial star six, and that will unmute your line. Um, but please do keep your lines muted during the presentation. Also, you'll notice that there's a chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, you can use this chat box to field any questions that you might have for the presenter during the question and answer period. Uh, as well, if you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, uh, you can use this chat area to type your message, or you can click on my name and send me a private message, uh, and I can try to help you as best as I can. I also want to mention that we are recording the webinar today, uh, and I'll be sending out a copy of the recording to all those who have pre-registered with me, and we'll also be posting it to the Community of Practice website. And finally, I know we have some people on the line today who may not be familiar with what the Forestry Adaptation Community of Practice, or the FACOP, is. So I wanted to take this opportunity just to quickly mention that it's an interactive online community and it's dedicated to those who are working in forestry or who are simply interested in forestry and climate change adaptation in Canada. Um, it includes features such as news articles, events, an online library, discussion forums, um, and much more. So it's free to join. Um, so if there's anyone on the line today who's interested in learning more about the FACOP, um, please just click on the link in the chat box there for more information and to register. So with that being said, we're very excited to have David Peterson on the line with us today to talk about science management partnerships and forest adaptation. Uh, just so you know a little bit more about your presenter, Dave is a research biologist with the U.S. Forest Service Pacific Northwest Research Station in Seattle. He has conducted research on fire science and climate change throughout Western North America and has published over 200 scientific articles and three books and as a contributing author for the IPCC, was a co-recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. He has also received an IUFRO uh, Scientific Achievement Award, um, and he, he recently published the book Climate Change and United States Forests, um, and currently works on climate change adaptation on federal lands throughout the West. So Dave and his wife live on their tree farm in Northwest Washington State. So on behalf of everyone joining us, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you, Dave, for you know, taking the time to present this webinar for us today. It's very, very much appreciated. So without further ado, I will now turn things over to you. Well, thank you, Annette. I appreciate that introduction. And I would like to thank the group for the invitation to give this webinar today. Um, I have been trying to follow as many of the webinars as I can over the last year or so. And I've been very impressed by the subject matter and have learned a lot. And I think this is a great forum for uh, distributing information and for shared learning across North America. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge the contributions that some of the folks uh, in, in my Canadian colleagues at least have made, uh, particularly my friends and colleagues in the Canadian Forest Service and some other institutions, and specifically Jason Edwards, Kelvin Hirsch, Tim Williamson, uh, Mark Johnston, also Harry Nelson at UBC, um, conversations with these folks, uh, talking at meetings, uh, following their publications has been a real inspiration to me. And to a certain extent, I feel like I'm always trying to catch up with these guys. So um, it's nice to, to have you all as colleagues. And um, I think that we can probably both benefit from continued dialogue in the future. What I'd like to talk about today is some work that we've been doing in the, for the last six or seven years south of the border. And uh, 
mostly it focuses on partnerships that we have developed focused on assessing the uh, vulnerability of resources to climate change and then following that up with adaptation practices. So I'd like to summarize our work today and then I'll try to keep this fairly short and data free so that we can have plenty of time for discussion. Um, we are fortunate that we have a lot of information on which to base our work. And I know that's true also for, for you folks in Canada. Uh, a few years ago, we published this pub, uh, guidebook for developing adaptation options in national forests. But I think it's more broad than that. It can really apply to almost any type of lands. But we wanted to really establish this baseline for our resource managers so they could refer to this and, and move forward. The U.S. Forest Service has developed a really nice online portal of information called the Climate Change Resource Center. You can see the URL there below. I would really encourage folks to take a look at this if you can. It's not necessarily uh, specific to the U United States. This is information that is communicated in a manner that is highly accessible to resource managers. This is a resource for them. So there are scientific bibliographies and so forth, but there are also lots of fact sheets. There are videos. There are short courses. There are tutorials, um, all kinds of different things that would be very useful for resource managers, and in some cases, even the general public. So I would encourage you to take a look at that when you have a chance. Um, a couple years ago, we were involved in developing some significant science syntheses. Every five years or so, the United States develops something called the National Climate Assessment. It's essentially a where are we now look at climate change. And so this has been going on for close to 20 years now, and I helped direct the synthesis for the forest sector in the United States. And so we're, we've gotten pretty good at putting out these big, thick, heavy publications that are packed uh, with lots of information. In this case, we had about a 1,000 uh, literature citations. And then just this past year, we published this book on climate change in U.S. forests, which also emanated from the National Climate Assessment. We've had pretty good response on this. Uh, we tried to make the information, again, uh, fairly accessible to resource managers. I, I do believe we have enough academic material and books out there and we need things that, that people can use and apply on the ground. So if you look at this slide, you see a guy drinking from a fire hose. And this is a metaphor that's used quite often. Um, it's used especially by my resource manager colleagues in the U.S. Forest Service. And they feel like they have so much information out there, scientific and otherwise, that they, they just can't <clears throat> uh, really filter through it. They don't have the time. They don't have the resources. And uh, I know as a scientist, I feel that way myself, so I can imagine how they feel. In order to move forward with climate change adaptation, I really feel like we, we really don't need more research. And I know that's, that's sort of a career-limiting statement for a research scientist like myself. But I think we can't afford to wait another 10 or 20 years to start the adaptation process. We never, we'll never have 100% certainty on anything let alone climate change. So it's just time to move forward and do the best we can with what we have. I'd like to describe the framework and process that we have used over the past several years for moving forward with a climate change adaptation process. We always start with the development of science management partnerships. So this is simply a group of resource, research scientists and resource managers who are willing to work together for a year or two and are committed to following the process from start to finish. Now, that may sound fairly simple, but getting people to work towards this common goal with everything else they have to do is not always that easy. This will typically start with an educational process with a particular national forest, national park, or other organization. Uh, we've held many, many workshops going over Climate Change 101, other sorts of topics. And the idea here is to get everybody on the same page, the same baseline in terms of their understanding of climate science. The next step is to identify the sensitivity 
of natural resources to climate change, simply called a vulnerability assessment. I'm sure everyone's fairly familiar with that. The vulnerability assessment then is the foundation for developing adaptation options, uh, including both strategic and tactical options. And then the final step is to take all this information and actually incorporate it into existing planning and operational entities within the various management units. And it's that last step that has been a real challenge for us, in all honesty. And I think we're just really now getting to the point that we can do that effectively. There's been some reticence, and I'll talk about that a little bit later in the talk. The process we use in each case is to identify the key resources. So this will be things like vegetation, water, wildlife, fisheries, and so forth. Then we develop a synthesis of the climate change sensitivities. We use that to develop adaptation strategies, which are general approaches, followed by tactics or on-the-ground actions. In addition to that, which is really the heart of the project, we also try to identify the various opportunities and barriers for implementation so managers know what they need to deal with, as well as some of the information gaps that we might have that would require further monitoring research or other specific activities. I'm going to give you just a few brief examples here to indicate what this really looks like for uh, the science management partnerships. I know that right, right now it seems kind of conceptual, but this is what we come up with through our partnerships and through our various workshops. So in this case, I'm going to talk about water resources. One of the prominent vulnerabilities that we find, at least in the Pacific Northwest region of the United States, is the expectation for much higher peak flows in our streams in the fall and winter as a result of reduced snowpack. One adaptation strategy for this is to try to design our infrastructure so we can not fight this, but to accommodate higher peak flows, uh, infrastructure being roads, bridges, culverts, and so forth. An on-the-ground tactic would look like uh, upsizing our culverts so they can handle larger flows, reducing our road network in the floodplains that are most vulnerable to flooding, and then relocating some of the infrastructure such as campgrounds and various facilities that will be continuously flooded out. So this is a way of coping with a future that's going to have higher floods and more frequent floods. Another example for fisheries. Uh, we anticipate a significant impact on cold water fisheries um, in a lot of our mountainous regions, including some species that are either rare or endangered. So higher stream temperatures that occur during the summer will significantly degrade habitat across large areas. One way of addressing this strategically is to both restore and maintain cold water habitat so that we can continue to provide high quality uh, systems for those cold water fish. What this looks like on the ground is, first of all, we need to know where that cold water habitat is. So we can do some mapping, some data collection and synthesis. Restoration plays a big role here. We can try to get these uh, side channels back in operation and functional. Increase shading in some of our riparian areas to cool the waters. And you'll notice here that, you know, these are all things that a lot of resource managers are already doing. So these are existing kinds of practices. People are familiar with them. And so it's a matter maybe of accelerating those or modifying those practices that we're already doing. And I think this is a really important point for our resource managers because what we don't want them to think is that we're going to change their world with climate change, that here's yet another thing they have to deal with. Really, it's a fine-tuning of a lot of our existing practices related to sustainable uh, resource management. I think that's a, that makes it a much less bitter pill to swallow. A final example for vegetation that will probably be familiar to most people, um, it's kind of a no-brainer that as it gets warmer in the future that we're going to have more fire and longer fire season. Uh, that may already be occurring in Western North America. And a kind of typical adaptation strategy is to try to increase the resilience of some of our dry forests to this more frequent fire. 
it's, it's probably not wise to resist it. We're not going to stop fire, but we might be able to modify and reduce its severity. So what this looks like on the ground is reducing some of our stand densities to eliminate hazard fuels, um, reduce the surface fuels across landscape. And then finally, I think an underrated strategy or tactic here is to manage for diverse standing. So we don't have everything in the same stand and um, structural classes, but we have some diversity out there. So if one area, one particular age or structure is lost to fire or another stressor such as insects, then we have others that will survive and maintain some uh, ecological diversity across the landscape. Again, these are the kinds of things that are already happening in some of the east side drier forests. Uh, hazardous fuel treatments have been going on for decades. It may be a matter, again, of accelerating those treatments or perhaps modifying them a bit to accommodate our expectation for a warmer climate and for increased presence of wildfire. I'd like to switch gears a little bit now and tell you about some of the projects that we've been engaged in. About seven years ago, we started with our very first climate change adaptation project. Uh, this was on the Olympic Peninsula in northwest Washington, and it focused on Olympic National Forest and Olympic National Park, which are adjacent to each other on that little uh, land area in the red circle. So it's a fairly self-contained area uh, that includes a diverse range of habitats from temperate rainforest to fairly dry forest, low elevation, high elevation, you know, lots of diversity in a small area. And in this case, the National Forest actually came to us and asked if we could help them get started. They basically wanted to, wanted to push us forward. And I'll have to say that in the first meeting we had with the resource managers, there were a lot of folks at the table who were maybe a bit skeptical or didn't see why we had to start doing this now on top of all their other responsibilities. By the end of the process, process, we had a very engaged workforce, and there was a lot of support from the, the resource management staff here to move forward. It's not insignificant that we had a national forest and national park collaborating here. National forests have very different uh, mandates for management than the national parks, which are primarily preser preservationists, so utilitarian, and preservationist philosophies and policies side by side. Fortunately, these two uh, organizations had a history of working well together, and everybody knew each other, so we were able to put together some pretty good teams. The publication you see on the left side of the screen was the outcome of that project. So this was probably about a 600,000 hectare uh, land area, a uh, fairly self-contained little region. And uh, I have to, have to uh, admit to you that uh, we made a lot of mistakes in this process, and we learned a lot. And I think this has had a great benefits for all of our future projects, though. So we got the kinks worked out, and we, we at least knew a little bit more about what we were doing after this. In our next project, we upscaled things a bit. We moved over to north central Washington, the mountainous region in the Cascade Range. This particular partnership included two national forests, the Mount Baker Snoqualmie and the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forests, as well as North Cascades National Park and Mount Rainier National Park. So this was more like a um, three million hectare land area, so quite a bit larger much more complex. It ranged from wet west side environments to dry east side environments. The, um, the land area towards the north end of that red circle contains about 60% of all the ice glacial mass in the conterminous United States. So lots of water, lots of snow, lots of ice, and just an enormous diversity in um, biogeography of this region. Once again, 
we benefited from the fact that all of these entities have a good working relationship. Their executive teams meet twice a year, so they're familiar with each other's issues, and although they have different uh, management policy mandates, they're able to appreciate those and work well together. So we're very fortunate to walk into this existing situation. The other thing that was quite interesting with this partnership is we were able to pull in uh, about 35 different stakeholders into our partnership, including the workshops, ranging from Native American tribes to uh, hydroelectric utility companies, um, state entities, uh, various non-governmental organizations, um, highway departments, all kinds of people participated in this. So it was a real coming together of people with different perspectives. And this is a URL where you can check this one out. Uh, this adaptationpartners.org website is a portal for all of our adaptation projects, and I would invite folks to take a quick look at that if you have a chance. The North Cascadia Adaptation Partnership took an all-lands approach. And I know this is something that people talk about a lot. You know, everybody needs to work together and all this kind of stuff, but it doesn't happen very well very often. And in this case, as I mentioned, we had lots of different stakeholders, and uh, all the different colors here represent different land ownerships, uh, different agencies and organizations who participated in this particular project. So this makes things more complex but I think it also makes it more complete and, in the end, more effective. This is the publication that came out of that project. It was published about three months ago. Always happy to send folks copies of this, or you can request them from the U.S. Forest Service online. Uh, in this case, we covered vegetation, wildlife, water resources, and uh, fisheries. We were very pleased that there were a number of follow-up projects that came out of this one, uh, particularly related to hydrology and roads. In western Washington, in the last decade, there's been tens of millions of dollars worth of damage to low elevation roads due to increased flooding in the fall and winter. Resource managers are realizing that this is only going to get worse in the future, and they're very concerned about maintaining or somehow managing this system sustainably as well as continuing to maintain access to public lands. And I think that if, if you can design projects to encourage an ongoing dialogue and not just drop a publication in their lap and walk away, it will certainly have much longer lasting effects. An additional project that we're just in the process of completing now is in the northeastern corner of Oregon, the Blue Mountains region. This includes three national forests, uh, again, about a three million hectare land area uh, dominated by dry forest, um, very heavily cut in the past, significant uh, issues related to both fire hazard and insect outbreaks. Um, this is an area that has become uh, very contested in terms of access to water, access to recreation, and then livestock grazing. So they have a lot of social and economic issues here. Um, and then the usual issues associated with rural communities who are resource dependent, and now that those resources might be somewhat threatened by climate change. Again, you can find information on the project here. We hope to have a, uh, actually the, the draft uh, assessment and adaptation plan is out for peer review right now, so that's coming along quite nicely. So we then took a big step. We've been doing these local to sub-regional projects, and then we were requested to become involved in a regional scale project in uh, what we call the Northern Rockies. Of course, it's the Southern Rockies for, for Canada, uh, but that's the term they use there. And this is in the uh, uh, northern region of the U.S. Forest Service. You can see the map here that encompasses Montana, North Dakota, northern Idaho, and the northwest corner of Wyoming. So this is an enormous land area. It includes 15 national forests, three national parks. We also included uh, participants from the uh, U.S. Bureau of Land Management, which primarily has grassland and uh, rangelands, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, tribal uh, participants, state participants. Again, we had 30-some stakeholders involved. Uh, we conducted 
five different workshops across this region. And again, this is, this is very much a learning experience. This is our first regional scale project. The thing that this did was it was a lot more efficient. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to continue doing a few national forests at a time because it just takes an awful lot of energy focused in one particular place. And we have only so many people to go around. Um, getting a whole bunch of national forests and national parks at once and then taking some effort to try to downscale that information to local landscapes seems to me to be much more, more efficient, at least for our situation, uh, than doing the smaller scale projects. So uh, we have now a draft vulnerability assessment adaptation plan completed that will be going out for peer review in the next month or two, and all this information will be posted at the URL listed there. Uh, we have also started another regional scale project farther to the south in Utah, Nevada, and southern Idaho. So we'll get to take this framework and this process and try to move that to a new location and see how it works. So we've been doing this now for about seven years. And we've learned an awful lot. And what I am often asked by the leadership at our management partners' uh, agencies is, well, what, what do we get out of this? We're going to invest some time and effort and uh, uh, human resources into this. What's the outcome? Why is it worth taking a year or two to do this? So I've, I've gone to great pains to make this nice, short, concise list here. And the top one here is something that's been pointed out to me by one of my colleagues in resource management. She said, you know, regardless of any of the publications, any of the databases, any of the websites, the most important product for her was climate change thinking by her people, the resource managers, and some awareness of how this affects their jobs and their management and their planning. So this is kind of like a seed you plant in the brain and it's one of the many things that you consider when you're developing a management plan, when you're putting a project on the ground. I think this is particularly important for our younger folks, the, the newer folks, the 30-somethings that are coming into our resource management uh, organizations. Uh, they're going to be dealing with this for the rest of their career. And even if some of our older cohort are a little bit resistant, the younger folks, I think, are much more open, and they're going to be incorporating this into business operations. The second thing is, by taking the time to bring people together and develop these partnerships, it provides a forum for people to exchange ideas and different perspectives. You're always going to have conflicts. Nothing wrong with that. We can get through that. But just simply having that venue where people can have these discussions and in some cases continue the partnerships beyond the actual climate change project itself, there will be you know, many benefits into the future. In many cases, we've been able to motivate the collection of data or synthesis of information that wouldn't have otherwise occurred. This is occurring in a new context, but in some cases it also has benefits beyond this particular project. Our management partners have really liked having this website. And they like it because they can point people to it and say, hey, this is our project. We've got this going. Um, it, it takes on sort of a reality to it. We update this. We send out newsletters. newsletters, And it, it, it takes on some reality beyond just talking about it. The publication is very important, I think, because it provides a peer-reviewed peer source of information that resource managers can cite in their planning documentation thus giving it more credibility and also providing them with some options that they can use in their planning documents. The journal articles are, of course, important for us resource, research scientists, but I think they also add credibility to the effort. And then finally, being able to stimulate follow-up projects that carry on additional work in fisheries, water, and so forth um, are often very useful, and they keep the momentum and the dialogue going. But I really do think the most important outcome here, and this is my perspective as a federal employee working with federal agencies, is building the organizational capacity to address the effects of climate change. So we talk a lot about the adaptive capacity of species or the adaptive capacity of ecosystems to um, 
reduce the effects, the negative effects of climate change. Well, that's important also for our organization to have the capacity in terms of people, knowledge, and skills to incorporate this in everyday business practices. Just as we have many other concepts like uh, ecosystem management, ecological restoration, conservation of biological diversity, you know, these are terms that weren't used much before 20, 25 years ago, and they have since become paradigm for management and planning. Uh, climate change, too, will someday probably become a paradigm of sustainable resource management. This little map here shows different areas where we have either completed projects or have projects underway relative to adaptation. <clears throat> each of the blue dots is a national forest. Each of the red dots is a national park. So we're, we're making our way around the western U.S. And uh, I think <clears throat> what we're finding is that once we complete one successful project, it seems to stimulate others to want to get on board and do the same thing, which is exactly what we want to catalyze this work. <clears throat> so we have these enduring partnerships starting to get developed. We have communities of practice, if you will, developing across the West. And we're getting a lot more information out there that people can use. Each time we do a new assessment, each time we do a new publication, we, it gets easier for the next assessment and the next publication because we can build and emulate on those previous projects. Uh, another thing people ask me a lot is, how do you make these things work? And I don't have any magic bullets here. The things I'm going to list here will not be a surprise, I don't think, to folks who are participating today. Uh, the very first step is you have to get the support of leadership. If the superintendents, supervisors, leaders do not give you license to move forward and do this project and allow their people to spend time on it, it's not going to happen. So that's the very first step. I also find it's, it's terribly important to develop a sense of commitment and trust. Mostly that is gaining the trust by the resource management cadre with the research, research scientist cadre. I know, at least for myself, it's always humbling to talk to a group of resource managers because I find out how little I know and how much I can learn from them. And they have to know that you're equals and that you're not going to come in and say, this is how it is. There's, there has to be equal partnership there. Communication is critical. I'd say that takes up about 50% of my time. Um, I still feel like face-to-face -face communication is the best, despite all the, the, um, you know, the media and technical uh, options that we have, as well as social media. Most of our resource management leadership is still of an older demography, and they like the face contact. I think that builds credibility. Develop a realistic schedule. You have to make this successful. Don't, don't promise anything you can't deliver. Choose your battles. We cannot do everything everywhere. Uh, it's more realistic to do a good job on four or five resources than to identify 15 or 20 and get spread too thinly. And then finally, be really open to working with your neighbors. Talk to folks who are outside of your specific um, agency or land area. Get lots of input, let get, get lots of perspectives, and then there's more likely to be broad-based acceptance in that region of what happens. The shared learning, I know it's kind of a, a trite phrase that's used a lot, but I think for climate change adaptation, it's absolutely critical. So that concludes what I have to say here today. Uh, this is our website. Again, I'd like to invite you to uh, take a look at that. And if anybody would like to communicate about this topic after the webinar, please feel free to send me an email, give me a phone call, whatever, and we'll, we'll carry forward with this. Again, I'd like to thank everyone for their uh, participation today and for having me here. And I'd like to make one final comment before I uh, go to the question and answer session. And that is, in talking to some of my colleagues like um, Jason Edwards and, and Kelvin Hirsch and, and others, I've been struck by the similarity of our approaches. And we have developed these approaches somewhat independently, so we have sort of a parallel evolution going on. But I think collectively, we're finding out what works and that we're able to move these projects forward with that knowledge. It's, it's encouraging to me that we can have a consistent process for doing this. And I think we should, uh, should be proud and happy that we can, can do that sort of thing and that I hope that we can continue to exchange information in the future. 
I think that our um, I think that our my Canadian colleagues are doing a much better job on community based adaptation than we do in the state. And so I have a lot to learn yet and look forward to learning more in the future. So back to you, Annette. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, so everybody, we now have about 25 minutes left for questions, so tons and tons of time. Um, so if you do have questions or comments, um, now is the time to ask. Again, uh, if you'd like to use the chat box, please feel free to go ahead and type out your question, and then I can just read it out loud for everyone. Uh, if you are on the conference call line with us um, and would prefer to ask a question over the telephone, all you're going to have to do is hit star six, and that will end your line. So Dave, I don't know if you can see on the in the chat box here, Jenny Gleason has a, a question that falls actually in line very closely with slide 24, the last slide. Um, but if you have any other comments, so she writes, do you have any recommendations for how to best build partnerships and engage diverse stakeholders when scaling up to regional level assessments and adaptation planning? Yeah, that's a tremendous question. Thank you, Jenny. And, um, I don't think there's any magic bullet answer for that. It's just a heck of a lot of hard work. I think, um, at least in, in my own mind, I had to get out of my comfort zone and talk to a lot of people that I haven't talked to before and do cold calls and invite people to meetings, invite people to conference calls, invite them to workshops, and provide forums where it's comfortable for people to sit down and talk to each other across the table in a friendly way. Um, what we found when we did this with our North Cascadia project was that if we could create a kind of a friendly environment that people put aside their personal agendas and they put aside their agency hats and they focused on the resource because that's why they got into this business in the first place because they really liked fish or they really liked trees or they really liked uh, elk or deer or something and they, you know, in their heart of hearts, they wanted to do what was right for the conservation of those organisms or those systems. So, and I think the other key, when you, you do have workshops or other um, opportunities for people to talk, is to have excellent facilitators who know how to engage every single person who is at the table or on the phone. I think, you know, as this process moves forward, we're starting to also identify people who tend to be more or less interested in the process and make sure that they're at the table because then they generate energy to get other people at the table. One of the, the challenging issues for us, in all honesty, is to engage some of our tribal partners. Uh, they are essentially separate nations. Uh, they often don't have much resource management capacity. So we like to get them involved, but it's difficult and takes lots and lots of talking and communication. I think. Uh, my uh, examples I've seen of partnerships in Canada with First Nations have done a much better job than we have at that. I know that wasn't a great answer, Jenny, but I think that's the answer I have today. <laughs> that's perfect. Thanks, Dave. Um, so I don't see any other questions on the chat box, but I'll go to the conference call line. So is there anybody on the line that, that would like to ask a question? If so, please just hit star six and go right ahead. And that there's a note here. Above Jenny's question. Oh, is there? Can you see it? Uh, I have a couple of mine, but I don't see anything else. One by Ching Lin Li. Oh, that was before. I think that was on reference to slide 12. Um, so they wrote um, mapping cold water streams versus the already heated channels. And oh, I don't yes. know if that's a question um, or that's, Actually, things. let me clarify that. The, the point there was to uh, identify and map the cold water streams with the idea that those cold water streams will be refugia for cold water fish in the future. And so our management practices should probably focus on those areas that are likely to continue to persist in the future rather than waste a lot of time on very low elevation streams that are going to get so warm that they can't support good habitat anyway. Okay, perfect. And they're typing a message now, so we might have a follow-up question or a comment. Um, in the meantime, is there anybody on the conference call line that has a question for me? Give everybody a few seconds here. Okay, 
So I write, um, it is a technical one and some ideas already um, below. So thanks for clearing that up. Okay. Perfect. So any other questions for Dave? While we're waiting, Dave, I have a question for you, if that's okay. Um, okay. So in your opinion, you know, what can be done to accelerate implementation of climate change adaptation on the ground? Well, as I alluded to early in the, the webinar today, this has been a particular challenge for us over the past few years. And I think most people are very receptive to, first of all, the concept that things are changing and that we may need to do things differently in the future. But there's a sufficient complexity in the process going from the planning stage to the management project stage to the implementation on the ground stage that there is some level of discomfort about doing that. People who have been trained to do certain things in certain ways over the course of 10, 20, 30 years are reticent to, to make significant changes in that process unless you give them a really good reason why that's a good thing. So I think part of this will be simply time and uh, uh, in getting this in people's minds that, okay, let's do some experiments out there. Let's try some different things in different places. I think in some cases we have been rather formulaic about our management options and we have these uh, recipe books for you do X, Y, and Z in place A, B, and C, and then that's it. So we may try to broaden people's thinking a little bit, but let's try a few different things. Go back, see how it works, and then modify things if necessary. The other um, component of this that makes it challenging is, at least for our national forest system, planning is like a Bible. Unless, what, unless you have something in a national forest um, management plan or a fire management plan or timber management plan, it's not going to happen. So that's the authorizing document. And any change that we're going to make relative to climate change has to be in that plan which then will be cited in a project management document, which then might be carried out in the field. So I think if we can kind of push ourselves through these complexities, both in our thinking and in our processes, we'll have a much better chance to do it. And the last thing I'll say about this is we need leadership who are willing to make these changes and take some risks to try different things out there. Yeah, perfect. Okay, thanks so much. Um, so Randy Ford has a question here in the chat box. So is there a sense of urgency about dealing with the changing climate or that there is plenty of time? I think the, the sense of urgency varies tremendously across the map in my experience. And I think everybody has probably um, had the experience of different um, resource managers, different management units have different perspectives and different belief systems and different approaches to things. And that's exactly what we're encountering. And I cannot you know, talk someone into believing that we have to do something now. And I think that urgency is starting to gain some momentum in my experience. In Western Washington, as I had mentioned, there has been a tremendous loss of infrastructure in the last decade due to this increase in flooding. People see that. And they're feeling it in the pocketbook. They can no longer maintain this enormous infrastructure of roads and national forests that were built to basically maintain a timber industry that, for the most part, no longer exists. We cannot maintain, uh, you know, 4,000 kilometers of roads on a national forest because they're falling apart. And they're going to fall apart even faster, especially at low elevation. The, the managers of some of the national forests are also starting to hear from their user base, primarily recreationists, who in many cases cannot get access to places where they want to get into for hiking or, or boating or hunting or whatever. And sometimes that may go on for five or six years before a road gets repaired. So they're starting to hear from their users. These are not users who are complaining about climate change. They're complaining about access. They're complaining about the quality of the fisheries because there's so much sediment in them from the uh, flooding and erosion. So I think the case for the urgency may be built somewhat peripherally to the actual effect itself. 
So in my mind, whatever gets the job done, but I, I do think it is slowly changing and I hope that will continue. Excellent, thank you. Okay, I don't see any more questions in the chat box. I'll do one more time to see if anybody on the conference line has a question or comment. If so, please go right ahead. Okay, so if not, last and final call, I'll give everybody another uh, 10 seconds here, just in case there's any last minute questions before we wrap up. Okay, well, if not, then I guess uh, we'll wrap things up for today. So obviously I'd like to thank everybody for joining us for the FA Cup webinar. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Um, and obviously a very, very big thank you goes out to you, Dave, for, uh, for your time and effort and for a really great um, and informative presentation.